just got a new camera and microphone, so I'm just testing to make sure that it works. Can everybody hear me? I can, Kimberly. This is Drew. Yes, I can oh, hear I can't you. hear you, Drew. You can or cannot? <laughs> Sounds like she cannot. Can you hear me, Lynn? I can hear you. Okay, that's positive. Every day is a new day with these meetings. Just because it worked the last time doesn't mean it's going to work this time. Exactly. Let's see. All right. I could hear you now, Drew. Okay, great. <laughs> that was my computer. That was, that was my technical issue, sorry. Okay, good. No <laughs> problem at all. Hey, Drew, can you hear me? Yes. So we'll get started in just a minute or so. So it looks, looks like we have all of our uh, water contractors, except I'm looking to see if we have Katati. I don't, I don't see Craig yet. But other than that, we're looking pretty good. And, f and uh, Fergie as well, City of Sonoma. Okay, um, it's 9.02. Good morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> happy March 1st. We're in March already. It was a quick February. Uh, we're, we are going to um, start off just with agenda item number one, which is the... Check in. Uh, again, we're going to have, uh, I just want to remind everybody from the agencies, just because it is a virtual meeting, to state your full name and uh, what agency you are representing. And I'm going to ask, uh, who's going to do Easter, I guess. Yes. Uh, Easter, you're going to do the roll call, please? Yes. Mm -hmm. City Katati. Presence. City of Petaluma. Uh, Kent Carruthers, City of Petaluma. City of Burnett Park. Mary Grace Pawson, City of Burnett Park. City of Santa Rosa. Uh, Jennifer Burke, Santa Rosa Water. City of Sonoma. North Burn Water District. Drew McIntyre, North Burn Water District. Town of Windsor. Christina Goulart, Town of Windsor. Valley of the Moon Water District. Good morning, this is Matt with Valley of the Moon Water District, Matt Fulner. Marin Municipal Water District. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Easter. Uh, let the meeting minutes uh, reflect that we do have a quorum today for the for the TAC meeting, so that's good. Um, I want to again remind everybody to mute your phones uh, when you're not speaking, just to cut down on any uh, background noise. Uh, are there any public attendees, Easter? 
Yes. For staff and public attendees, we have Roberta Aza, Don Seymour, Grant Davis, Kimberly Zunino, Lynn Roselli, Pam Jean, Paul Piazza, Claire Nordley, Colin Close, David Manning, Margaret DiGenova, Paul Selsky, Peter Martin, Sandy Potter, Stephen Hancock, and Tony Williams, and Jason Beattie. Okay, thank you, Easter. We're gonna to move to agenda item number two, public comment. These, these are, uh, this is for anybody from the public that would like to speak for, on something that was not on the agenda. Uh, I did not receive anything via email or voicemail on my phone via the 5 p.m. cutoff last night. Uh, is there uh, anything at all from public comment uh, at the Zoom meeting this morning? Agenda item two, items not on the agenda. And that would be Secretary Atha, I guess, if you see any indication. There are no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no public comments for agenda item number two, then we move to item number three, which is approve the FY2122 water transmission system budget. Um, again, this is a action item uh, for the TAC uh, after review of the actual budget to approve to recommend bringing it to the uh, WAC for approval. And um, there, as everybody will recall, there was a budget uh, finance uh, subcommittee set up with the chair of Kimberly Zunino. I wanted to again, thank Kimberly for doing this again uh, for another year. And, and I also want to thank the subcommittee group as well for their work on reviewing the budget. And so Kimberly, you want to, you want to kind of give an overview of the, uh, what transpired, what transpired with the budget subcommittee before having Lynn Roselli give a presentation on the budget. I'll do that. Um, good morning. So I will just provide a brief overview of the budget subcommittee work before Ms. Roselli presents the Sonoma Water Transmission System budget for fiscal year 2021-22. Um, the Technical Advisory Budget Subcommittee uh, with representatives from Sonoma Water, Town of Windsor, City of Katati, City of Santa Rosa, North Marin Water District, Marin Municipal Water District, and City of Sonoma reviewed the proposed 2021-22 budget um, with the first proposal from Sonoma Water, the wholesale rate increases were at 6.56% for Santa Rosa and Petaluma Aqueducts and 4.96% for the Sonoma Aqueduct. Um, after our first round of review, um, Sonoma Water, the increases were reduced to 4.1% and 2.8% respectively. And at that point, the contractors on both the Santa Rosa and the Petaluma Aqueducts agreed to reduce the discretionary capital charge from $27 to $20 per acre foot, allowing for an additional reduction. Um, the final proposed wholesale rate increases are now at 3.47 for Santa Rosa and Petaluma Aqueducts and 3.43 for the Sonoma Aqueduct. Uh, Lynn Roselli will be providing you much more detail, but the subcommittee was satisfied with the final proposed budget and increases and unanimously approved the recommendation to the TAC. And that is my update. And if there are no questions, I will hand it over to Lynn Roselli. Any questions from the TAC on Kimberly's initial summary? Okay, uh, Lynn, you wanna go ahead and do your presentation, please? Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So Roberta, are you going to bring up the presentation? There we go. Perfect. Okay. Uh, my name is Lynn Rosselli. I'm the Administrative Services Division Manager for Sonoma Water. Uh, we are the division of Sonoma Water that puts together the budget and rate package. 
and we are presenting the proposed draft budget and rates for the water transmission system today. Next slide. Uh, so uh, for those of you that may not be as familiar with Sonoma Waters Enterprises, we have water supply, water transmission, flood protection on 75,000 uh, uh, miles of streams and 75 miles of streams and, and creeks. We have eight wastewater treatment plants and we have an energy and sustainability program that helped us get to uh, carbon free water. Next slide. Next. So today we are just going to be talking about the water transmission system. The revenues we see receive for each one of these enterprises is is uh, only allowed to be used for its intended purpose and uh, is not uh, commingled with any other funds. Next slide, please. So a little bit about background about the uh, process that we went through for the budget. Uh, the budget and rate setting process is governed by the restructured agreement for water supply that was signed in 2006 by the water contractors. Uh, and uh, as Kimberly mentioned, uh, we started with, prepare, we prepared internally uh, of the uh, budget and rates beginning in October, November. We get a draft out to the technical budget subcommittee uh, mid-January. We receive input and incorporate that input in January and February. And then we are here today for the technical advisory committee meeting uh, to vote, make a recommendation on the budget and rates. And then we will be making presentations to those uh, city town councils and water district boards in March, then come back for the water advisory committee vote on April 5th. And then we take it to our board for adoption on April 20th. Next slide, please. Whoops, back one, I think. There we go. So water transmission system activities and funds. So we budget for, it looks like we missed a slide somewhere in there. Can you back up? Back up one, there we go. So uh, the water transmission system, uh, just very briefly for those that are not as familiar with it, we have the Wooler Mirabelle production or collection wells up in the upper left-hand corner. We have three aqueducts, Santa Rosa, Petaluma, Sonoma. We prepare a budget and a rate for each one of those aqueducts. And, uh, for, and the customers on each, the water contractors or customers on each one of those aqueducts pays the rate specific to that aqueduct. Next slide. Okay, so we went over this, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so operations and maintenance. So we budget on the three aqueducts, we budget for operations and maintenance, and then we have four sub funds, uh, five capital funds, and a number of debt service funds. Uh, I just wanna point out briefly that the water management fund is for the urban water management plan that has been completed this fiscal year and has very minimal funding next fiscal year that we will fund with fund balance. The Watershed Planning and Restoration Fund is for the uh, Russian River Biological Opinion from 2006, includes uh, estuary management of uh, fish flow EIR and the Dry Creek Habitat Enhancement Project. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'm gonna start off with the capital project budgets. Uh, we have, uh, these are the, the five main projects, uh, hazard mitigation projects. The top four have FEMA funding. Uh, the last one, Sonoma Aqueduct Crossing, uh, we are trying to get to the preliminary design done in next fiscal year so that we can apply for FEMA funding and offset some of the costs to the water contractors. Uh, the fiscal year 21-22 budget is $5.4 million. Next slide, please. And other capital projects, this is not a complete list, but the major ones are, are shown here. They will have activities in fiscal year 21-22. Uh, the budget for these other activities, some of them are already underway, uh, is 4.3 million. And when you combine these projects with the hazard mitigation projects, you have a total budget for capital projects of 9.7 million. Next slide, please. Uh, for operations and maintenance, we have a number of projects. The highlights are a cathodic protection project on the Santa Rosa Aqueduct and Russian River Katadi Intertie. That's a $3.2 million project. Uh, that will be occurring next fiscal year. We have pump and valve replacements and the ongoing tank maintenance. And then for, we have a number of different studies. Uh, the Regional Water Supply Resiliency Study is a study that is uh, going on in collaboration with all of the water contractors and continues to move forward uh, uh, with the work plan implementation. Um, and for any, any other details on the operations and maintenance fund, you can find it on PDF page 29, or if you're looking at a hard copy, it is page 21 of the budget rate package. Uh, so the budget for O&M is $30.5 million. Next slide, please. 
So these are the sub fund costs. Again, the uh, water management is for the urban water management plan and the uh, cost there will not be significant in 21, 22 and we'll fund with fund balance. But we do have uh, a number of biological opinion compliance projects, including the uh, Dry Creek Habitat Enhancement Project, uh, phase four. We're doing that in collaboration with the Army Corps. Uh, we plan to, uh, Army Corps is planning to construct that in 21, 22. And uh, the water contractor's cost share is 35%. The Army Corps is making up the other 65%, which results in some significant uh, savings for the water contractors. Um, we are also in the third driest year on record. Um, so looking down the eyes of a, of, uh, down the tunnel of a drought, and we have uh, uh, funding for water conservation and water use efficiency. Um, including uh, two Prop 1 uh, grant funded programs that we work with the water contractors on that are involved in those programs. Uh, and a lot of, uh, so the water education, water use efficiency programs are all budgeted uh, in the water conservation fund. So the fund, uh, the budget, sorry, the budget for those funds is 11.05 million for the sub funds. Next slide, please. So in comparison to uh, this fiscal year's budget, this uh, budget, the budget for fiscal year 21-22 is $3 million, approximately $3 million less than this year's budget. Uh, we made significant strides and efforts in uh, cutting some of the costs uh, to keep the uh, budget and rates lower uh, because of the pandemic and to be sensitive to the hardships that it's causing. Um, however, when uh, you take the net value of uh, the net total, uh, between fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 2122, the total net budget for this fiscal year is $43 and for next fiscal year is uh, $47. And that is where uh, it makes up uh, the, the change in the rate. So you'll see that as we go forward and start to talk about the rate generation. This is about the budget and then we'll get into the rates in a minute. Uh, and the main uh, ish, uh, change here is that there is uh, 3 million less in capital projects um, and, and that makes up for the majority of it. Next slide, please. So this is just a pie chart to give you an example of how the budget is allocated. It's 54% for operations and maintenance, 17% for capital, 20% for the sub funds, including the biological opinion and water conservation, and 9% for the debt service funds with 8.5 million in offsetting uh, grants, bonds, and fund balance. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna transition to talk about the rates and the rate setting calculation, which is governed by the restructured grid for water supply. And it tells us to take the cost of operations and maintenance and divide it by the quantity of water sold. The quantity of water sold has to be the lesser of the three year annual average or the last 12 months. Um, so next, uh, this is an animated slide. So you can see those are the budgeted deliveries for uh, uh, this fiscal year of 46,095. It is the lesser of the two. Uh, and uh, the 12 months was 47,748. And when you do the math, you get $1,000 per acre foot for the Santa Rosa and Petaluma aqueducts. Uh, this is just an example. The, the calculation is a little bit more complicated than this, but this gives you an idea of how it is calculated and the fact that it is very sensitive to water deliveries, being that we are in a very dry year, a drought year, and we don't know what the future is. And in our, our experience from prior years has been that when we have drought years, we see deliveries in the order of 42,000 acre feet or 44,000 acre feet, which would significantly undercut the revenue that we were anticipating for uh, this budget cycle. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, we just wanted to give you an example of how our rates compare to other wholesale water rates in uh, the, the Bay Area. We're on the far left, it's $1,000 per acre foot. Uh, Zone 7 and San Francisco Public Utilities Commission elected not to increase their rates this year due to, due to COVID. Santa Clara Valley Water District is proposing a 9.6% rate increase that is not shown in this because it has not been adopted yet. Contra Costa County is showing a 3.72% rate increase with another 3.72 rate increase the following year. Um, next slide, please. Whoops. Okay, so here is our breakdown of the proposed rates and budget. It's based for each one of the aqueducts. It's based on 46,095 acre feet in deliveries. That is a 4% increase in deliveries over this year's budget. Uh, and this provides the breakdown. It shows the 3.47% rate increase on the Santa Rosa and Petaluma aqueduct 
and a 3.43 percent uh, rate increase on the Sonoma Aqueduct. And I direct your attention to the discretionary charges. The water contractors have uh, the discretion to uh, set the capital charges on their aqueducts to build fund balance for future projects and to use as a rate stabilization tool. And as uh, Kimberly mentioned at the start, the water contractors are using it to bring, you know, they had originally started with $27 per acre foot on the Santa Rosa and Petaluma aqueducts. They lowered that to $20 uh, uh, in order to bring the rate increase down to 3.47%. Uh, next slide, please. And so I wanted to summarize some of the budget and rate reduction measures. Uh, Kimberly alluded to some of that already. Uh, we reduced the rate increase from 6.5% to 4.1. Uh, Santa Rosa and Petaluma Aqueduct on the budget subcommittee uh, further reduced their aqueduct capital charge to get to a rate increase of 3.47%. Sonoma Aqueduct actually increased their aqueduct capital charge from $32 to $38 in order to have a rate increase that was similar to Santa Rosa and Petaluma. Uh, and also because uh, they have such a small customer base, they need to continuously add funds to their capital fund in order to be able to pay for the cap projects, uh, capital projects on their aqueduct. So we saved about 1.3 million overall. Uh, we were able to decrease capital project costs. We increased fund balance. We, we pushed the water management sub fund rate down to zero. So we're using fund balance to fund that. We shaved a little bit off of water conservation labor and all of these measures were taken uh, in, uh, in light of the fact that uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic. We know that customers are experiencing serious financial hardships. We wanted to make sure that, and, and as a result, because the water contractors have to provide water uh, to their customers and their customers may not be able to pay, it, it represents a significant hardship. So we made every effort to uh, reduce our rate increase, but not to the point where we felt uh, that we wouldn't be able to reliably and safely manage the water transmission system. And uh, it's it, it's a balancing act in terms of uh, the need to um, uh, meet the you know keep rates low, but at the same time be responsible and manage the water transmission system. We're facing a drought year. We're expecting that we may have lower uh, deliveries. And so we didn't want to go lower than this because of that. Um, and just as an example, the rate increase on average is approximately 65 cents per household per month when our rate is trans is, is uh, passed through to customers. Um, that can be a lot when you don't can't pay rent and can't pay your utility bill. We understand that. Hopefully this coming year, there will be some relief for customers to help them pay their rent and their utility bills and uh, we can start a recovery process. Next slide, please. And uh, next steps, uh, we're here today for the TAC to vote on the uh, uh, the budget and rate to make a recommendation to their WAC members. Uh, we're making presentations the month of March. Water Advisory Committee meeting is on April 5th and we take it to our board on April 20th for adoption. And that is all I have and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Lynn. Um, before I open it up just to the TAC, I do want to acknowledge the collaborative arrangement um, and efforts that were being made during this process through agency staff and the finance subcommittee. Certainly appreciate uh, the efforts that were made to um, sharpen the pencil and make adjustments in the budget to where we're looking at right now. So. With that, I'd like to open it up for comments from the TAC. And again, recognize this will be an action item for, for the TAC once we're done receiving comments. I don't see anybody raising their hands. So uh, next thing I'd like to do is open it up to the public. If there are any comments on this agenda item number three for the FY21-22 water transmission system budget, uh, if anybody in the public wishes to make a comment, please raise your hand in Zoom or hit dial star nine if you're participating via phone. Secretary Atha, do you, do you see any indication that there are any public comments on this item? Yes, we have one hand raised. David Keller, I'll allow to talk. One moment. Please. Good morning, David. Be able to unmute and make your comment. 
Got it. Thank you. Um, thanks, Lynn, for the presentation. Um, I want to know, is there anything in the upcoming budget for um, either the uh, studies for Potabelli project um, that need to go forward or for formation of the regional entity that hopefully will own it? Uh, the Potter Valley project is not budgeted in the water transmission system. It is budgeted under the water supply enterprise. So the water transmission water contractors are um, in, in the water transmission budget are not paying for anything to do with Potter Valley projects. That's a good thing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the public on this item? Okay, hearing or seeing none, then uh, I'm gonna ask Secretary uh, Ledesma to do a roll call for the TAC approving this uh, budget to bring to the WAC for uh, adoption at the special meeting that's held on April 5th. City of Katati. Uh, uh, yes, hi. City of Petaluma. Yes, Kent Carruthers, City of Petaluma. City of Bernard Park. Uh, Mary Grace Pawson, City of Bernard Park, yes. City of Santa Rosa. Uh, Jennifer Burke, Santa Rosa Water, yes. City of Sonoma. Colleen Ferguson, City of Sonoma, yes. Northburn Water District. Drew McIntyre, Northburn Water District, yes. Town of Windsor. Christina Goulart, Town of Windsor, yes. And Valley of the Moon Water District. At Fulner, Valley of the Moon Water District, yes. And the item is unanimously approved. Okay, thank you, Easter. And again, um, thanks to Kimberly and the uh, Budget Finance Subcommittee uh, for the good work on this, and obviously to Lynn and SCWA staff to uh, shepherd this through to, to approval. Okay, we're gonna move on to agenda item number four, which is uh, water supply conditions and temporary urgency change order update. And I believe Don Seymour is going to be kicking this off. Good morning, Drew. Good morning, everyone. Don Seymour, Seymour Water. So starting at the top of the watershed, Lake Pillsbury is just under 37,000 acre feet. This is about 67% of the available storage with the uh, slide gates and radial gates closed. Um, I think I, earlier at earlier meetings, I'd mentioned King Jeannie had been pursuing a variance. Um, they seem that that seems to be postponed. I think they're waiting to see how the hydrologic year kind of ends up. Um, however, if I, I think if storage doesn't greatly increase at Lake Pillsbury over the next four to six weeks, uh, PG and will likely pick up that process again and be filing something similar to what they did last year. Um, Lake Mendocino is currently at about 32,600 acre feet. This is just under 48% of the available storage for this time of year. Um, since uh, our last meeting, February 1, there's been this storage has increased by about 4,600 acre feet. The release is now about 25 CFS. This is the uh, absolute minimum under any condition from the reservoir. Um, I think to put things in a bit of perspective, you know, we like to compare things to 24. I think there's been a comparison of the 2021 20, year, 2021 uh, hydrologic conditions to 2013, 2014. This is about the same storage level we were at uh, this time of year in 2014. However, uh, a series of storms in March and April um, that, that, that uh, cumulatively, cumulatively dropped about eight or nine inches of precipitation over that time period resulted in uh, a max ending storage at Lake Mendocino of 51,000 acre feet. So kind of keep in mind the type of rainfall we're gonna need to see some recovery. However, I'd like to point out, you know, this comparison of 2013-14 to 2020-21 isn't uh, looking that, 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 that close anymore. Um, for example, in 2013, um, just outside of Ukiah, Gage has about 127 years of record received um, cumulatively 28 inches of rain in 2013 and 18 inches of rain in 2014. However, in 2020, that gauge only received 14 inches of rain over the entire season. And so far this year, 
10 inches of rain. So cumulatively, you know, we've received about half the rainfall in 2021, 2020, 2020, 21 that was received in 2013, 2014. So we have a pretty dry watershed out there. Uh, Lake Sonoma is just uh, over 156,000 acre feet. Um, this is 64% of the available storage at Lake Sonoma. The release is currently about 80 CFS. And uh, storage is, this is a, this storage level is about 14,000 acre feet lower than in 2014. So um, we're looking at very low storage levels for this time of year and really a need for some significant uh, precipitation in March and April. And we're, we're definitely running out of, out of wet seed, wet, the wet season to, to get there. Um, as you, on the temporary update for the temporary change order, um, that, when it, that, that order was approved February 4th. Um, and then just to remind everyone, that was that, that just requested changes to the upper Russian River that the water year type be based on storage thresholds at Lake Mendocino. Uh, Dry Creek and the lower Russian River are still, the water year type is still determined based on decision 1610 and our water rights. So as right now, March 1, um, the upper Russian River is in a critical water year type based on the order. And under decision 1610, Dry Creek and the lower Russian River are under a dry water, water year type. Um, and just to put that in perspective, if we, were, we did not have this order in place, um, the upper Russian River would also be under a dry water year type. And it would be requiring uh, Sonoma water right now to be releasing about 50 at least 50 CFS more than we are right now. So um, it's it's a significant help in preserving storage. Um, Sonoma Water staff is currently uh, addressing a number of terms and conditions that were in the order uh, based on its approval. And uh, we're, 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 we're working on uh, a number of issues that are terms that, will ha that have due dates of April 1. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but I have to answer. Okay. Thanks, Don. Uh, questions from the TAC on Don's uh, update on water supply conditions. Don, um, I've got a couple questions. First off, on uh, Lake Pillsbury, if if the capacity gets to 40,000 uh, acre feet, will PG&E then actually start diverting higher flows into the um, Lake Mendocino? No, it, um, the um, water year type for the Potter Valley projects also determined based on cumulative inflow into Lake Pillsbury through, and so it, uh, it's still currently a critical water year type for for Lake uh, for the Potter Valley project. So right now the transfer is about 45 CFS through the project. Um, and like I said, um, PG&E had been contemplating filing a variance that if they drop below a, 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 a it changed a bit, but initially 18,000 acre feet would have significantly reduced that transfer even more. So I think right now with the storage level they have, they're just trying to determine where they're going to end up at the end of the, the water, you know, the hydrologic year. And then based on that, they'll, like I said, if there's not, uh, storage doesn't greatly improve at Lake Pillsbury, I would anticipate that they will be filing um, a variance in April, similar to what they did last year. And um, we'll have to see what, what, what they request. If, I think if storage is, is below 40,000 acre feet, you're going to see the, a, a very low transfer into the, into the Russian River system, probably on the order of like 15 CFS, and then some amount for the contract with the Potter Valley Irrigation District. Okay, thanks, Don. And then in looking at today's um, Lake Mendocino storage graph, I mean, Lake Mendocino has been gaining of late, is that primarily just because of the transfers from PG&E into the reservoir or, or greater than the outflow and that's what we're seeing or? Yeah, and there's, it, uh, it's primarily the PVP transfer, but there's also been um, some unimpaired flows coming from the watershed. Um, that unfortunately that unimpaired flow has, has been declining 
Um, but right now, like I, um, I mentioned, we're at the very minimum release from Lake Mendocino of 25 CFS. And so we have a Delta and, and it's been gaining anywhere from 80 to like 100, 120 acre feet a day, but that's been kind of dropping off as the unimpaired flows dropped off. Okay, thanks, Don. Any other questions from the TAC before I open it up to the public? Seeing none, uh, we're now going to take public comment on this agenda item. Again, it's agenda item number four, water supply conditions and temporary urgency change order. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. Or if you're participating via telephone, hit um, star nine. And then Secretary Atha, if you can let me know if you see any indication of any live comments. There are no hands raised. Okay, and again, just for all of these agenda items, recall that I did not receive any public comment um, by the cutoff at 5 p.m. yesterday. Uh, so um, we will, Don, thanks again for that report. We'll now move to agenda item number five, Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership. Uh, first item is uh, water production relative to 2013. Um, if uh, Secretary Atha, if you could go ahead and pull that up on the screen, great. Thank you. Um, if you could, I don't know if you could blow that up a little bit just for readability. Uh, okay, so as we normally do, we're starting off a new calendar year. So this is water usage by the partnership um, for the month of, of January. And again, this is so the, the tabul table one and table two are the same because the year to date and the monthly is, is all just one month starting this new year. You can see that the partnership's water usage is 5% uh, below that in 2013. And if you could scroll down a little bit further, um, you can see the chart one, which, which shows the current water use um, versus 2013 on a, on a month to month basis over the last 12 months. And then if you scroll down a little bit further, you get the, the chart two, which shows the regional water supply uh, use uh, gallons per day per capita. And again, recall that uh, while the water use is down 5% from 2013, uh, the, the water use in terms of gallons per day per capita from uh, about the, in the early 2000s, late 1990s is down about 37%. Uh, versus what had been used historically. And you can see that in the, the orange color graph over time. Uh, and that was well above what the uh, SBX 7-7 uh, state mandate, a 20% reduction. Again, the partnership uh, was at a 37% reduction. So uh, that's just reflective of everything that the uh, retail water contractors have been doing on their uh, aggressive funding of water conservation and recycled water, et cetera, uh, for these trends that you see over time. Any questions from the TAC on the water production data? Seeing none, any questions from the public on the water production data? This is agenda item 5A. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, thank you, Secretary Atha. Let's move to agenda item B then, water supply conditions, uh, public outreach messaging. So this is a, just an update on what's been taking place um, by the agency and the partnership related to these uh, dry year conditions. And Paul Piazza is gonna provide this update. Thank you, Drew. Good morning, members of the TAC and uh, those who are joining the audience. The uh, partnership has been convening a winter outreach subcommittee on a biweekly basis due to the current low rainfall and water supply conditions. 
Uh, we last met <clears throat> on February 11th to look at uh, or to get input on ramping up the uh, campaign that was launched earlier in the year using a series of 10 ads um, focused on social media outreach. Um, we've received direction from the subcommittee to um, take a, a smaller subset of that social media ad campaign and um, revamp them to make them a little bit more usable for an actual digital media placement by. So we are uh, moving forward with that. Um, we also provided a, a draft uh, broadcast radio script for input and review by the partners. And we're moving forward with launching that as well. Uh, we had a meeting just last week on Thursday, uh, the 25th, where they reviewed, uh, the subcommittee reviewed the series of uh, five ads. Um, I want to recognize uh, Barry and his team with our Community and Government Affairs Department who are uh, taking on the work for the outreach uh, portion of this. Um, so they are doing some of the graphic design work and working with uh, a graphic design consultant to get those uh, ads uh, ready for release. Um, there was some input received Thursday that incorporated some changes and the ads were redistributed on Friday uh, for final input by the subcommittee before being forwarded to the consultant to do some graphic design touch up before release. So those are moving forward as well. And then uh, you, you probably noticed at the top of this page, uh, we're adopting um, a campaign that was provided by the city of Santa Rosa. The tagline is being used for the both the social media campaign and the digital media ads. But uh, in this case, it was taken from uh, an email signature block. So we're all working to uh, push out some messaging for our staffs to help um, notice that we're in a dry year. Um, and this can be used by any of their partners. So the plan being that um, the work that comes out of this outreach subcommittee will enable us to share all of the um, resources and approaches that we put together for the rest of the partnership staff. Uh, and that can be co-branded through their um, social media sites. They can choose to do uh, additional outreach with the digital campaign ads to use for e-news, bill inserts, um, if they want to do um, additional ad placements in their local papers, um, that's that's an option for the partnership. Um, let's see, what else? There were some newly developed uh, water supply infographics developed by our CAGA staff, and those were shared with the subcommittee for the first time. Um, they weren't quite ready for prime time, so I don't have a version of them here for this meeting, but um, our CAGA staff will be able to provide those soon and we can share those with the group. Um, we're continuing discussions on additional um, ramping up activities to include um, what may be a regional event similar to what was done in the last drought, either as a drought drive up event or in creating a community challenge. Um, wasn't quite, you know, something we had decided on entirely, but we're continuing the discussions on that to move forward with additional outreach. So um, that's it for now. I'm happy to take questions from staff or the public. Thank you, Paul. Uh, questions from the TAC on Paul's update? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to taking any questions from the public. This is agenda item number five, 5B water supply conditions, public outreach messaging. Is there anybody from the public that would like to make a comment on this agenda item? I'm seeing no hands raised. Okay, thank you, Secretary Atha. Uh, we will now move to agenda item number six, biological opinion status update, Pam. Yeah, can you hear me okay, Drew? Yes. Okay. Um, hopefully everybody got a copy of this along with the agenda. And I want to start off by thanking Easter, who I think got a couple of panicked emails over the weekend from <laughs> Nama Water staff who had not received the agenda because we had a 
an issue with our email for a couple hours on Friday or Thursday or Friday, whatever the day that was now. And so <laughs> several of us over the weekend realized that we didn't have um, any of the meeting information and she promptly Saturday afternoon sent it out to us. So thank you Easter very much for first of all, monitoring your email over the weekend, but also getting it out to us. So really appreciate that. Um, so uh, as I said, hopefully everybody has the handout at this point and I'll just run through it pretty quickly, hitting hopefully just sort of the changes um, as y'all um, are hearing this update every month. Um, <clears throat> starting off with the fish flow project, we do continue to work on that project. Um, some of the materials that have been developed to help educate the public are gonna be part of the public policy facilitating committee meeting, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, it's the very last portion of this report, but I just wanted to mention that um, some of the work that's being done as part of the fishbowl project will actually uh, appear at that meeting. Um, so I also, on, on Dry Creek Habitat Enhancement Project, we have two remaining elements to complete this summer in 2021. Um, those are uh, portions of phase three, which is the last mile of the first three miles of the habitat enhancement work on Dry Creek. Um, the construction window, of course, starts in June, ends in mid-October. So <clears throat> that's the construction that will be going on that will hopefully be wrapping up uh, phase three. Um, we, uh, our environmental staff continues to do biological surveys of the sites that uh, were constructed and or maintained uh, during the summer and the fall to verify that they've been built according to plan and are providing um, habitat, they're quantifying that habitat. Uh, there's kind of a nice description in here of, of what exactly they're doing, but essentially the, the output of that work is that um, they'll be developing maps and analyzing habitat quality and quantity to identify um, what's out there, what changes have occurred over time. So um, again, um, there's a, a nice little write up here if everybody can read it. Uh, as far as phases four through six go, um, Interfluve, who's working on the phase four portion of the project, is um, has completed the bid documents um, for the project. This um, piece of work, the phase four, is, is centered approximately one mile downstream and two miles upstream of Yoakum Bridge on the creek, so sort of in the upper portion of the watershed there. And um, there's some issues with right-of-way. Some of the property owners have requested some changing, changes to the right-of-way agreements, so um, the Corps is currently reviewing the changes that have been requested and given the time it might take to get the review and approval of those changes, the construction may be delayed. So we'll just have to see. In the meantime, um, they are working on procuring logs and large woody debris uh, or large woody materials for the project. Um, again, this is for phase four and that that procurement work will count towards the Sonoma water share of the project um, cost, which is the 35% in kind match. And um, we do have a, a contract going to our board of directors in April to execute contracts with the suppliers. Um, we also continue to advance the right of way agreements on the phase, with the phase five property owners. Um, and uh, Cardno, who is the consultant working on the design of phase five is addressing comments. Um, I'm sorry, is, um, is Cardinals working on phase six, not five. They're also working on um, some, some um, appraising those easements, meeting with property owners, et cetera, out there. And construction of phase five is scheduled for 2022. Cardno, who's working on phase six of the project, is addressing final comments on the design plans and specifications. So we've got all three of these phases happening, happening in parallel, and um, there's just a lot of work being done. Um, so there's also the last paragraph in here, I'm not gonna go over it completely, um, but there is a, a small piece of work that's being done um, sort of as a 
keep your fingers crossed to make sure that we have enough um, work done out, habitat enhancement work out there done to meet our full six miles. So um, there is a little bit of extra work being done by ESA um, to do some work um, in another area that's not part of phases one, two, three, or four, five, six. Um, as far as fish monitoring goes, it has not been a great year. Um, the video monitoring at Mirabelle Dam is done because the dam is down. And um, they're working on getting through all of the video. But so far, the count looks like it's going to be the lowest it's been since we started doing the monitoring in 2000. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, I'm not going to go through some of them are explained in here. Um, but uh, it doesn't look great this year. And this is not, um, doesn't seem to be specifically to the Russian River watershed. They're seeing this all up and down the coast. So um, at least that's what our um, agency, resource agency partners are telling us. Um, one of the things I noted when I read this was that since 2015, the estimated number of Chinook smolts leaving Dry Creek, those are the small guys heading out to the ocean, um, has been less than 50% since 2009. So you're definitely seeing a decline. Um, and there's a lot of um, years in there, there's some years in there where we've had high flows in Dry Creek and uh, flood releases, sustained flood releases. and. We do think that some of the low return this year has to do with what happened in 2017 when we had those high flows in Dry Creek. Um, as far as coho goes, um, coho and steelhead go, um, they've been pretty challenged this year. You can see from these photographs that are included in the update that we're already getting um, the tributaries to Dry Creek and, and tributaries just all together um, disconnecting from either the river and dry creek. And um, the lack of rain is, is not helping at this point. Um, not only can they not access these creeks um, when, when they disconnect like this, but they also get stranded. And in some places we have um, reds becoming exposed, which means that reds are their nests. So that means that um, those nests are becoming exposed and they're no longer watered, which means that anything that was in that nest is going to die. So, um, and as noted here, should this dry weather pattern continue, um, this could be a real problem um, for these fish. Um, a bright spot is, however, that um, Dry Creek is providing some great habitat for coho, and we're seeing them use that habitat, and they have an abundant supply of, of water, cool, clean water coming out of Lake Sonoma. So um, hopefully that will help those coho this year. Um, as far as the Russian River Estuary Management Project goes, um, we did experience uh, a lot of closures in 2020, um, eight, um, during the, eight during the whole year, two during the lagoon management period. Uh, we artificially breached the barrier beach four times in 2020. Um, and so far this year, in 2021, the mouth, mouth is closed four times. It's currently open. Um, so it, it's uh, not like way wide open, but it is open at this point. And we continue to do uh, pinniped monitoring out there. And there's an upcoming Q&A session with volunteers who are doing a lot of that pinniped monitoring work for us on April 29th. And if anybody's interested in that, there's a, a web link here to participate in that training or Q&A session as they're calling it. And there's a beautiful photo here of the Malfoy River. So um, Don already talked about interim flow changes and the water supply conditions. So I'm not gonna talk about that right now. We can answer any questions if somebody thinks of one. Um, but lastly, um, there is an upcoming public policy, policy facilitating committee meeting. This is a public meeting normally held annually, um, hosted by the public policy facilitating committee, which is made up of members of um, all those folks participating in biological opinion, including ourselves, the core, the resource agencies, the regional board, 
Um, and last year we had this meeting scheduled and COVID happened and it got canceled. Um, but we do have a virtual meeting scheduled for next week, next Tuesday. Um, and hopefully folks, if they're interested, can participate. You do need to register in order to um, participate. So please um, get in and register if you are at all interested. And the presentations will include um, presentations on the estuary management project, um, on the Dry Creek project. Um, there will be, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, a, a video explaining uh, it's kind of a Russian River 101. There's a couple of videos that have been put together in support of the fish flow and water rights project. And so that will also be provided and, and shown during the meeting. There will also be um, a chance for the public to comment if they so choose. And again, if you'd like to participate, make sure you register to do so. And I think that's it, Drew. Thank you, Pam. Um, questions from the TAC on Pam's report? I don't see anyone. Pam, um, on your, I have a question. You talk about some delays on phase four right of way related delays. So if if that gets delayed too much longer, am I correct to assume that then you could have construction of phase four and phase five in the 2022 year? That, that is possible. We're trying really hard to not have that happen because that's a lot of work in one year um, at the same time, but, um, but that is possible, yeah. Okay. Um, and then the the only other question that I had is what any insight on what the um, was generating ESA's uh, additional efforts related to a, a stretch that wasn't really part of the defined phases for potential enhancement is that I understand in reading this it was to address maybe if there was a a shortage of the total six miles required. This is trying to make up a shortfall. Is that correct? Yeah, and David Manning has his hand up. Maybe if um, I'm not sure who's who's monitor who's handling the, the Zoom, but he um, can explain that to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Pam. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Very good. So. Uh, in construction of phase three work, some of the projects were located uh, downstream in an area that has quite a lot of quite a lot of sediment deposition. And we've been trying to adaptively manage one of those areas below West Side Road Bridge, uh, sort of the lower portion of Dry Creek, uh, and have decided to abandon efforts to continue to reconstruct that section. We are uncertain how much the resource agencies will require us to make up in terms of habitat that is no longer provided in that reach. So we have uh, secured this uh, preliminary agreement with the property owner we are working with currently for the work Pam described this upcoming this summer uh, to extend that section of the project, do a little bit of planning in the event uh, we're asked to essentially mitigate for the loss of that habitat uh, in the reach to portion of the creek. Uh, as you know, it takes many years to develop these projects and plan them. So we felt it best uh, to do that work now to be uh, sure we're in compliance with the VO uh, at the end of 2023, now 2024. So it's effectively an, an adaptive management strategy to make sure that should the resource agencies question that section of the creek, which was filled during a really high flow winter that Pam mentioned. So there is some negotiation with the resource agencies around uh, the amount of habitat that needs to be replaced because it was certainly a, um, you know, a natural event that created those changes to the stream channel. So if we anticipate, um, it'll probably hold up to the six mile obligation. We want to make sure we can meet it. Okay, thank you, David. I appreciate that. 
additional um, information. Any question, any other questions of the TAC before I open it up to the public on this agenda item? I don't see any, so um, it's now time to take public comments. This is agenda item number six, biological opinion status update. Are there any comments from the public on this item? There are no hands raised. Okay, great. Okay, Pam, don't go anywhere. We're gonna talk uh, agenda item number seven, Potter Valley Project. Oh, let's, Lynn, did you have a hand raised for a reason? Yeah, just very briefly, I wanted to mention that that extra mileage is associated with uh, mile three and is not part of the water transmission budget. Okay, thank you, Lynn. All right, agenda item number seven, Potter Valley Project update. Pam? Um, so I think we're just kind of in a holding pattern right now on Potter Valley Project in terms of we're still waiting for the study plan determination from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission at this point. The partners are waiting for that. Um, we are, in, in terms of what's going on with FERC, we're in a holding pattern. We are not in a holding pattern as far as um, trying to get some other things done. And, and probably one of the bigger things is um, we are starting um, to hopefully um, do something about getting some funding. And so we're working really hard on that um, between all the partners and, and all the contacts that we all have. So um, that's really the, the big push right now is to, to try to figure that out. Okay, thanks, Pam. And I'm gonna just piggyback on Pam's report and add just a quick update on the uh, Huffman uh, Potter Valley Project ad hoc meeting that uh, the last one occurred Friday, February 29th. Um, there were really two agenda items on this. One was to report out on uh, what was believed to have been after FERC had responded to, and made a study plan determination. So there wasn't much to say on that because uh, FERC is still not yet made their determination that had been expected mid-January. Uh, so the only other real agenda item was related to the funding, as Pam had mentioned. Um, there was a discussion again that, you know, these, these studies will require at least eight to $10 million um, to perform and that you know, they have been prioritized, recognizing that all that money would most not, most likely not be available immediately. Uh, indications are that the initial prioritization would require about two and a half to $3 million. Um, there was mention about uh, a recent omnibus bill in Congress uh, that has the potential to provide some funding um, for for these studies. However, no money has actually been appropriated uh, yet on that, but that is a, uh, a promising scenario. And there was also discussions about trying to get funding from PG&E and the fact that there just hasn't been anything yet from PG&E um, freed up yet, but there is a strong desire, obviously, with the partners to continue to work with pg and &E to, to have that be a funding window, as well as the omnibus um, aspect. So uh, that, that meeting with Huffman lasted only about an hour. Um, there was supposed to be a follow-up meeting. You know, they try to schedule these meetings every couple of months or so. Um, there's um, supposed to be a follow-up meeting scheduled um, relatively soon, I haven't heard. Pam, have you heard of a, of a new date yet? No, I haven't. They talked okay. about a month from that meeting, which was January right. 29th, and I haven't heard anything about another ad hoc at this point. Maybe they're waiting for the study plan determination, which would make sense. Right, right, okay. Okay, and so that's kind of a, a brief update on the Huffman process. Any questions from the TAC on this PVP update. I don't see any indications from the TAC, so I'll go ahead and open up 
Again, this is agenda item number seven, Potter Valley Project. Open this up for any public comments. I see no hands raised. Okay, thank you, Secretary Atha. So we're gonna move now to agenda item number eight, uh, Sonoma Waters Climate Adaptation Plan. And there's going to be a PowerPoint presentation associated with this. I think this is gonna be a tag team from Jay uh, Jaspers and Dale Roberts, uh, at least those two. So uh, Jay, are you gonna be the one kicking this off? I will, Drew, thanks. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, Jay Jaspers, um, as Drew said, I'll be um, um, partnering with Dale Roberts, who is our project manager for the Climate Adaptation Plan. Also want to acknowledge uh, Jacobs, who I think most of you know, um, is our consultant for this project. Uh, and it's it's been uh, a few years that we've been working on this uh, Climate Adaptation Plan. Um, we are um, getting close to developing a comprehensive draft plan for the spring, and then we're hoping to finalize it in late summer uh, and take it to our board. I think we're planning in August, late August, I believe. Um, so we wanted to give you a briefing here at the TAC and then follow up um, in a few months with the WAC also to give a briefing uh, of the plan. Um, uh, I was timing it for uh, when the actual draft comes out. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, just very briefly, um, you know, this uh, uh, adaptation plan really is trying to respond to within our North, uh, North Bay Area region, um, the uh, the issues that are thrown at us from a climate risk uh, related uh, issues. Um, we certainly have our fair share of those as we all know and experience them and it involves our day to day operations, you know, with floods and, and droughts as we're, we've been talking about earlier and also wildfires are, uh, you know, obviously things we deal with um, unfortunately all the time here. Um, and what we're trying to aim to do with this climate adaptation plan is really to bring the science in, the research and science in, evaluate all of our facilities and our operations uh, and assess the vulnerability of those um, facilities. And then what we do is then we do a risk assessment. So it, we may have very vulnerable facilities, but if the consequence isn't that large, then that's a lower risk. But however, you know, we could have vulnerable facilities that have high consequence. So we're doing this not only for our water system, um, but also for sanitation and flood control. So it's comprehensive uh, throughout our operations. We of course are gonna be focusing today um, on, on our water system uh, given, uh, given uh, your audience. Um, so I'm going to just uh, talk a little bit about the background and uh, the process we used and some of the climate drivers. Then I'll turn it over to Dale to talk a little bit more about the uh, vulnerability risk assessments and um, how we are developing adaptation uh, project strategies and portfolios. And then the very end, um, Dale's just going to give you a quick update on a related project that we have that we're working with all of you on. Uh, with Jacobs also um, on the uh, resiliency study as we are beginning to implement uh, the work plan and starting phase two. So we just wanna give you a quick update at the very end of this. Next slide, please. So one of the things um, that we, um, our plan benefits from is, is really uh, a significant amount of investment within our region on partnering and with on the climate science and bringing that science down to a, a scale that uh, we can really leverage and use in our management decisions. And so we've been working um, at least 15 years with NOAA, uh, Office of Atmospheric Research and Weather Service. We have longstanding agreements and MOUs with them. Same with the US Geologic Survey and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab 
and also Scripps Institute of Oceanography, the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. And these are the major drivers uh, that I uh, essentially mentioned, and I'll go over a few now just in a, a, a little bit more detail. Next slide. So atmospheric rivers, uh, most of you know that um, I've been um, I'm blathering on about atmospheric rivers for about 10, maybe 10 years. Uh, and they are certainly a prime feature within our region, um, both for uh, driving floods and also uh, droughts. And this year we haven't had many atmospheric rivers, nor did we last year, and we have droughts. And so the when you look back in the historical record, and we've done studies um, with NOAA and Scripps back to the 1920s for our region, and you can parse out atmospheric rivers correlation to flooding and drought. It, it's, it really much uh, is the driver and tells the story. So it makes a lot of sense for us to try to better understand these events and predict them, um, either their lack or their occurrence. This uh, red dot figure in the lower left is from a paper by Tom Coringham out of UC San Diego that was published in 2019. Essentially what it did is it looked at the 11 Western United States and looked at the proportion of economic losses due to atmospheric rivers. You can see up in our region, um, it's about 98 to 99% of economic losses uh, from flooding are due to atmospheric rivers. It's about 80 some percent all total when you average the 11 Western states. And um, for then what he also did is he, he uh, ranked each county in the 11 Western United States as to the proportion of uh, damages uh, that occurred um, from atmospheric rivers. And sadly, Sonoma County ranked number one of all counties in the 11 Western United States um, over the last 40 years with 5.2 billion uh, in damages uh, from the county or in the county due to atmospheric rivers. So this is a very, I think, loud statement uh, from Mother Nature uh, in our region uh, as to that threat. Next slide. Fires, of course, is another, um, I don't need to talk too much about this, but uh, we certainly since uh, 2017, we've had more than our fair share of fires. And so this is also something we need to address in our uh, climate adaptation plan to build resiliency, not just uh, explicitly within our uh, built assets and facilities, but also in our natural water resources and protecting them too. And so we really have to look at the full scale of potential impacts from wildfires. Next slide. Um, this is a, a, a listing of some of the activities. I'm not going through those, but uh, we have been working for years on um, climate adaptation efforts. I mentioned partnering with research agencies and really uh, leveraging uh, the latest in, from the science and experts in this. Uh, forecast and flow and reservoir operations, I think, most of you are familiar with that. That's a perfect example of a climate adaptation program, as is our AQPI project uh, leading that in the Bay Area, uh, again, with many other agencies, water agencies, but also with the state and NOAA and Scripps, et cetera. Uh, and then, you know, local hazard mitigation planning. This is something that is a key strategy is combining this climate adaptation plan, much like we did several years ago, almost 20 years ago, uh, with the seismic hazard assessment that um, many of you may remember when we when we did that in the early 2000s and we linked that then to local hazard mitigation which then allowed us to get the FEMA funding to do seismic resiliency projects that we've been working on the last several years. Recently there's been uh, FEMA has allowed now climate risk uh, to be included and so this in a similar uh, analog, uh, we're hoping to bring this climate adaptation plan into our LHMP so that we can rank then and access these funds uh, from FEMA as well as other funding sources that we anticipate um, from the federal side that may be coming forward on climate risk. Next slide. 
And so our climate um, adaptation plan, as I mentioned, uh, really is, gonna, is comprehensive water supply, sanitation, and flood control. Uh, we're looking at this comprehensively. And we're also, um, like, we're gonna focus on water supply, uh, Dale will, but we're also thinking about connecting dots. So we may have adaptation strategies uh, from a water uh, from a wastewater side or a flood control side that has benefits for water supply. Maybe it's storm water recharge or using recycled water and vice versa. So we're really looking at those cross cutting uh, initiatives where we get the win-win. Next slide. This is the overarching um, framework that we have been working under, starting with the purple step one, the problem scoping, and then step two, which is the hazard understanding and, and mapping, which we've done a lot of work bringing in and synthesizing the data, the modeling, the science, and making it relevant uh, on the ground to our actual operations and our facilities. Uh, then we did the vulnerability and risk assess uh, assessments, which I mentioned briefly, Dale will go into that a little bit more. And then from there, identifying the adaptation strategies and then portfolio of strategies too. And then this is meant to be a continual process as we uh, uh, operationalize this. So there'll be an implementation and monitoring aspect to this too, because we want to make sure what we're doing, we're getting a bang for the buck and we're moving the needle on overall resiliency for our operations. Next slide. And these are, uh, I think you know, these are, should be no surprises here. Uh, these are the, uh, uh, the climate and hydrologic uh, drivers um, uh, for our region. And I'll just, you know, temperature, sea level rise, precipitation, variability, I sh it should be uh, drought, wildfire, and river flooding. Um, and next slide. Just touch on these. This is this slide just shows several of the models that we use, and they all consistently show um, increase in temperature. And so that has consequences. Even if uh, some of the rainfall models and um, show higher uh, rainfall, and some show uh, drier conditions in the future. So there's not agreement there, but all of them show warmer conditions. And of course, that has consequences uh, both from a water supply, but also a landscape. Um, uh, issue too and impacts that we have to be cognizant of in our, in our operations. Next slide. Sea level rise, uh, of course, is, is going to be significant for us um, and in uh, primarily in the Petaluma and Sonoma Valleys, but also at uh, Jenner uh, um, uh, on the Russian River. Uh, those are areas that we really have to consider uh, and understand. Uh, this, sh this shows the uh, Petaluma and Sonoma um, with uh, a, a scenario for future uh, uh, sea level rise. Uh, this, this particular slide doesn't show the animation. Uh, we have another version that kind of shows animation there that is a little more compelling. But uh, this has been a big issue for those of you involved in Sigma issues um, where we're dealing with this too uh, for the Petaluma uh, uh, groundwater Sustainability Plan and the Sonoma Valley Groundwater Sustainability Plan also. Next slide. And then precipitation uh, extremes. Um, the atmospheric rivers, um, there's fairly consistent understanding from all the different models. You know, some may overall, as I said, show on average a little higher rainfall relative to historical conditions. Some show uh, drier conditions, but what they all seem to show is that there's uh, increasing um, uh, amount of rain is going to come from these atmospheric rivers. And these atmospheric rivers are very narrow bands, as you know, and it's a hit or miss proposition. So although we like the Goldilocks uh, just, just enough, but not too much, uh, what we see with more of our rain being focused in on atmospheric rivers is more variability. So um, maybe on average, you might get more rain or less rain, but the variability, the dries are going to be drier and the wets are going to be wetter. And this slide just shows some of the uh, uh, forecasting of increased intensity of these um, atmospheric rivers too, because it will be warmer and the equatorial region will drive stronger uh, rains with a weaker uh, jet stream in the future. Next slide. 
And then I think enough set on increasing fire risks and, and potential water quality impacts too. That of course is very, we're very mindful of, as I mentioned earlier. All right, next slide, please. And I think this is where I turn it over to Dale to talk about uh, some of the, uh, the, the process in developing um, uh, adaptation portfolios. Dale? Uh, thanks, Jay. Uh, everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Thumbs up or raise the roof gesture? Yes, yes. Can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so, thank. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Drew and others uh, in Easter for getting us. Uh, our email system, as Pam mentioned, was out. So, when people ask, "Did you get external emails?" you go, "I don't know." So, uh, we we uh, found out later that uh, a lot of things went missing uh, into the ether. So, thanks for rallying and getting it done. Uh, as Jay mentioned, uh, we looked at our CISPOs, our three core functions, water supply, flood management, and sanitation or wastewater um, for the modern word for it, and looked at what some of these uh, projected climate threats uh, would be uh, to that infrastructure, the, uh, matching those on the left, uh, those issues on the left with the systems on the right. Uh, next slide, please. And so when you look at vulnerability, you're looking at how vulnerable it is, but also how, how adapt, what's your adaptive capacity and compare those together. I'm sure many of you have gone through this process on other uh, systems, but uh, um, when we say adaptive ca capacity, uh, we're basically saying, can you do something about it? And we've historically been able to do some things uh, such as uh, instead of at our infiltration plans, instead of letting uh, the river level rise and over top of the bank, we open gates down below and they fill in from the bottom. So you get less uh, um, trickle over, just beat it to the punch. We expect to um, see more situations like that. Where we'll have to do what we've done in the past and perhaps more so. Uh, then when you look at the risk, as Jay mentioned, it's not just um, are you vulnerable, but what is what is the consequence of, of those uh, vulnerabilities and what's actually the likelihood and you, the product of those two determines whether you're, uh, how big the risk is. I mean, there's always going to be some risk, but uh, is it worth doing something about? Uh, so we went through that process with uh, all of our systems. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we looked at uh, each of our assets within our three core functions, water supply, sanitation, and flood management. This is some of the uh, water supply systems. There's more than this that we looked at um, and went through that process for each one of them. Something weird happened on the, uh, uh, the, the column headings there. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, at, least, uh, at least the low, medium, high or matching up in the correct boxes, but you could see uh, Mirabel diversion facilities are more vulnerable to river flooding and wildfire, at least uh, the risk of them and is uh, uh, worse than say drought or even extreme precipitation and went through that for that process for all of our systems. Uh, next slide, slide please. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the process that we went through. So knowing those um, uh, vulnerabilities and risks, uh, we met with staff uh, in meetings like the one shown here, uh, where we uh, uh, brainstormed and looked at uh, through all the ideas out on the table, uh, came up with over 250 uh, initial concepts uh, collected, some wild ones, uh, some pragmatic ones, and some of the things that we're already doing. Uh, we pared those down and categorized them into um, groupings into different portfolios based on uh, where they stood uh, and eventually got it down to closer to 80 concepts. Uh, and that's across all uh, water, sanitation, and flood control. Uh, next slide, please. And then from those, uh, we uh, went through a preliminary uh, prioritization or uh, look for the projects that would have the, the best bang for the buck and, and the ones that would actually move the needle on adapting to climate change. Um, and in most of those, we uh, looked at uh, how much control we had over the situation. When you look at the overall watershed, we don't own the watershed. We don't even own the water. We have the rights to the water, but uh, it, the water touches a lot on the way to when we can, can finally control it. So who do, so what do we build? Uh, how do we operate differently? Uh, who do we collaborate with? Uh, what um, 
what uh, policies do we need to uh, influence on the local, state, and federal level. Um, and those, um, those uh, uh, projects also looked at what are the uh, short-term big wins, what are the long-term uh, big wins, and what are the uh, what are those that you don't want to commit to yet because there could be a magical fossil fuel saver and don't put all your eggs in one uh, basket. It, it, the longer term projections are less certain. So we don't want to be elevating everything 20 feet off out of the floodplain if it's really not going to happen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is for water supply, uh, just and for sanitation and flood management, we also came up with uh, uh, five different, not deliberately five, it was just circumstantial, they all ended up being five. Uh, five uh, groupings of portfolios. I'm not gonna go through the whole uh, perimeter of projects that uh, fall under water supply. And within each of those projects, uh, the ones with a bold uh, bullet are the anchor for that particular uh, strategies such at the call it call it uh, 12 uh, to 2 p.m. if you will uh, pr the more infrastructure related than over to the right two to about 4 30 or so is uh, operationalizing uh, and all the way around um, you can see uh, the the bulleted items if you will are those that are the ones I was mentioning earlier it's kind of the anchor projects that would carry uh, that uh, overall uh, strategy, uh, whereas the others help in certain areas, but not uh, less broadly. Um, next slide, please. And Jay alluded to this earlier, some of the, um, the adaptation strategies we came up with weren't, didn't just benefit water supply exclusively or our system exclusively, they benefit both our uh, flood control systems and our sanitation systems. And so there's uh, synergies amongst those core functions and synergies with external entities uh, such that we can um, move the needle not only on our water supply, water transmission systems, but on our other core functions and other people's core functions. A uh, uh, classic example is that is that first bulleted item, uh, looking at the whole watershed resilience program, uh, some of the the work we've done in uh, fire smart and fire cameras and the like that helps us and it circumstantially helps uh, other entities and well uh, at other entities as well and there's some mutual we, we look always looking for mutually beneficial uh, uh, solutions um, that can help us and others in the long term and further down you can see next to last bullet forecast and form uh, operations Firo reservoir operations, uh, not just looking at Lake Mendocino, but looking at also at Lake Sonoma and potentially flood control structures. They're more passive system right now, but that type of solution is working now. It's needed more going into the future. Take advantage of existing assets and make just operate them differently rather than building something completely new, which is sometimes the simplistic uh, answer to solving problems. Uh, next slide, please. Am I frozen? Oh, there we go. Uh, got it. Um, so as Jay mentioned, uh, Don Seymour has been working with our consultant Jacobs Engineering to uh, embark, or we've embarked on a, a Sonoma Water Resiliency Study, which basically looks at uh, the, in, the, the whole uh, water system, not just our uh, arteries, if you will, but the, the additional um, uh, system beyond uh, the wholesale water supply and looking at the whole watershed and um, not just our backbone, but looking at all the retail customers, even looking at the groundwater basins in those areas and, and looking at, at it as if there's no jurisdictional boundaries across the whole system. And um, where's the best bang for our, our buck looking at that system? I don't know if you've, or I think you've already brought that uh, to this group, but that has some uh, uh, synergies with the climate adaptation plan as well. Some of the brainstorming that's going on under that project is mutually benefit, needs to take into consideration the uh, changes uh, in the climate that are impacting our systems and your systems as well. 
uh, and ultimately we'll have a decision support tool that will um, uh, bring to the surface those most optimal projects uh, that are beneficial, mutually beneficial to a number of parties. Uh, so with that, uh, next slide, please. I think that, oh, and this is kind of the, the schedule of it. Jay talked about the schedule of the climate adaptation plan. Our next step uh, for this group is uh, present it to the Water Advisory Committee at the May meeting and go to our board uh, late August. I think it's the 24th. But the resiliency study uh, wrapped up the work plan scoping document and beginning development and implementation of the, we're in phase two basically. Um, so that's uh, exciting stuff and underway, and hopefully we can keep uh, continually improving that. Uh, with that, we'll go to the next slide, which I think is the closeout slide. Uh, so you can contact Jay if you need more detail. Myself and Armin Munivar is our uh, project manager on Jacobs Engineering Consulting side, who's a wealth of information and did a similar climate adaptation plan for the whole Colorado River Basin. Uh, not that we're small potatoes or any less important, but uh, uh, very knowledgeable. Um, so just, just a shout out to them for the great work they've done on it. So Drew, with that, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dale. Thank you, Jay. Um, questions from the TAC on this report? I'm looking. Um, I don't see any, uh, Dale or Jay, I, I have a, a couple questions. So once this goes to the your board late August, what what do you envision? How will this be used? I guess in the future, I I know that one element is you know continued. This climate adapt, adaptation plan talks about the regional water supply resiliency study is one of the core projects and so that's moving forward Dale you already mentioned that and the group is is well aware of that some of the other projects that have, were identified in that pie chart is sort of high um, high priority projects uh, after this gets approved then is this setting the stage for being some of these projects being incorporated in their future agency budgets or how you know what how do you see this unfolding after the uh, approval by the board in August. So Drew, um, I'll take a shot at that. The climate adaptation plan um, is, you know, has uh, portfolios like Dale should, and some projects are already well underway. Um, and what we're trying to do is capture from those very mature projects all the way to projects that are just concepts. And so what it's doing though, is it's laying a framework of this whole climate risk resiliency. And uh, so it depends on the particular initiative. And again, it's also for sanitation and flood control too. Um, but in a broad sense, what we're, we're also trying to do is frame either a lot of the actions and projects were already well underway or we're starting into a climate risk um, framework because um, from the state perspective and grant funding and certainly with the federal also putting ourselves in a position to leverage and to show how all of this can then um, tie directly into benefits to operations and resiliency of our, of our um, facilities. And that's going to be very important to compete well on um, a lot of the uh, the funding and climate risk drivers, which um, certainly on the state has been very active. And um, we have had conversations with the state. They're very interested in this plan uh, because this is one of the leading plans that's being developed out there. And our consultant is also working for DWR on framing too. But now um, also what we're seeing is the federal opportunities too. And I mentioned one of them, which was recently now, um, climate, climate risks can be included mm -hmm. in your LHMP. And so now we're going to be not just looking at, you know, um, our LHMPs with other natural hazards like seismic is a, still a huge one that we're focused on, but now packaging with this plan, we'll be able to package our LHMP with climate risk 
uh, projects too. And ideally, we'll be able to do projects that do that bring resiliency to both. You know, it's not always going to happen, but that that's a that's really a, a goal uh, for as many places where we can um, make those connections is what we try to do. Okay, Dale, thanks, I don't Jay. know if you had anything to add to that. Uh, no, I'll just emphasize what Jay said is that uh, a lot of these um, ideas, uh, that they may be something we're already working on and we're, and we're not going to, uh, we don't want to create another plan and then um, just have it be its own animal. We want to operationalize this and incorporate it into existing systems, such as the capital projects plan, if it's an infrastructure type project, incorporate it into normal operations like forecast and form reservoir operation, make that normal and then boom we, we comes out of the climate adaptation plan or there's even you know funding strategies in there which i didn't really elaborate on but looking at uh, as jay mentioned uh, looking at state and federal funding and being being the poster child in the climate world uh in what's worthy of uh funding such that you can move the needle on adapting to climate change and um uh being uh, maybe, for lack of a better word, the, 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 the teacher's pet of, say, DWR or FEMA or something, because they, they, they want to show that projects are, are making a difference as well. So, uh, so basically, part of it is just is incorporating the elements into here, have them fit into uh, some of the programs we're already doing, and then we'll still track the climate adaptation plan and probably update it at a certain couple of year intervals uh, as we move forward to ensure, because we want to keep track of how is the climate changing. We're going to continue modeling and monitoring it and seeing if it's going where we're projecting. Right now, <laughs> the, the 20 teens show everything we predicted would happen, happened. <laughs> and had the wettest year, had the longest drought, had the nastiest fires. So uh, is that going to get worse? Uh, uh, okay. Not sure. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jay, uh, Jay and Dale. I'm, I was, uh, it's encouraging to hear another potential benefit is, you know, funding sources. I know the agency's done really well with the earlier work on hazard mitigation studies, folding into being successful and getting local hazard mitigation grants. So uh, that's encouraging to see that this climate adaptation plan could serve as a funding uh, mechanism as well for potential grant funds. Any other questions from the TAC on this before I open it up to public comment? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and open up agenda item number eight, Sonoma Waters Climate Adaptation Plan uh, to comments from the public. So if you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand or hit star nine on your phone if you're participating uh, via phone. Chair, there are no hands raised. Thank you, Secretary Affa. Uh, that brings us to the last item, uh, just items for, for the special WAC meeting on April 5th. So this is a this is a, a specially scheduled meeting. The, the primary role is uh, to have the WAC review and then approve uh, the water transmission system budget for FY 2022. Um, there's always the possibility between now and, and uh, finalizing this agenda that uh, some other high priority items could be added, but that's our focus right now is, is um, on budget approval for April 5th. Any comments from the TAC on this April 5th agenda? Seeing none, any comments from the public on agenda item number nine, special WAC meeting agenda for April 5th? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Thank you, Secretary Atha. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. That, that concludes our TAC meeting and uh, hope everybody has a a good week and, and um, they're projecting some precipitation at the end of this, at the end of this week. So let's all uh, keep our fingers crossed that we'll, that'll materialize. Again, have, have a good week.
Next row. 